Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, my name is Charles Rice with Next Labs. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for being here for uh, our webinar today presented by Next Labs and Infosystem. Today, we're going to be talking about how to accelerate digital transformations through automating compliance and risk management. So I'm going to be starting off. Uh, I'll be hosting today. Uh, and we'll just go over our agenda real fast. To start off with, I'll be doing introductions for our panelists today. Then we'll move into talking about some current trends and challenges, as well as the solution approach and business scenarios. Then we'll move over to some use case demonstrations and solution demonstrations. And then we'll have a question answer portion for everyone. At the bottom of your Zoom interface, you should see a question and answer uh, button. Using that, you'll be able to type in any questions you have during the webinar. Our panelists, uh, Krishna, a solution architect from Next Labs, and Nitin, uh, Infosys principal, will be able to answer those when they can. If we cannot get to it during the webinar, either through text or vocally at the end of the session, we should be able to email you directly. Feel free to reach out to me at charles.rice at nextlabs.com if you have any questions and uh, I'll be sure to either answer them or forward you to someone who can. Uh, with that all being said, I'm gonna throw it over to Ninton so we can begin our presentation. Thank you all. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, uh, before we get into uh, the meeting agenda, I would like to just briefly touch upon the current trends. I mean, when you talk about digital transformation, what do we hear these days? We talk about cloud, we hear remote working, artificial intelligence, big data, mobile, agile, all these things. Okay, but there is one thing that is common or that touches all these topics, and which is data security and compliance. So if you talk about cloud, there are more and more applications you want to move to the cloud, but at the same time you have to take care of the security needs which are different from the on-prem or, or the legacy infrastructure that you maintain and the compliance around the cloud infrastructure and the, the cloud applications. Similarly, uh, uh, robotic process automation. So you talk about robotics and, and different ways of automating your business processes through introduction of RPAs. But then at the same time, we also have to take care that we are compliant. OK, whatever accesses are given to these RPA bots, they they have to stay compliant and somebody is actually managing what is going on through these RPAs. Remote working, I mean, we all have been through this COVID scenario and this has increased the focus on remote working. OK, we want to work from wherever people are located rather than bringing everybody into offices like traditionally we have been doing. So remote working at the same time exposes the risk of data um, breaches and, and other security related issues that can come along. OK, that there are some regulated um, companies where the data has to be regulated or there are stringent norms on who can access what kind of data, but in a remote working environment, we we need additional measures to secure this data, unlike what was happening when the data was only accessed from the company premises. OK, similarly agile. So agile, uh, we talk about delivering projects, implementing solutions in an agile way. In the same way, data security or compliance is also needed to be agile. We cannot wait for programs to take months and, and years to to bring about a new security change or 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 changes related to compliance. We want these also to happen in an, in an agile way. So basically digital transformation touches the all the topics that we hear about in digital transformation. They somewhere or the other touch the security and compliance needs, which is what we will be discussing going forward. OK, so looking at the, the typical challenges that a, a big organization has in this area, uh, we see the need for enhancing security. Now, enhancing security could be a need because you want to enhance security in the applications on how you give access, or it may also be from a perspective of internal or, or some other regulatory compliance. Maybe let's say um, you want to uh, put some restrictions on who can actually create certain type of documents or who can post or approve documents for a certain value or even segregation of duty. So it's not just classic case of 
who can access what data, but also security is needed for who can do what kind of activities in in the business. OK, so the 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 challenge we see is organizations are adopting uh, multiple types of systems and also in a hybrid environment, which is cloud on prem and solutions which are best in class. They may not be from one single vendor or even if you talk about one single vendor offerings, every offering, every solution has a different security concept and the way to manage security and accesses privileges or authorizations is, is different in each system. So if you look at large organization having multiple such systems, managing security in this landscape becomes a challenge because every system will work differently. You will have to put different mechanisms and um, to have a uniform security policy getting applied into these varied systems becomes a massive effort to implement as well as to govern on an ongoing basis. OK, especially when you have a dynamic organization, people are moving from one location to other. People are changing jobs, so it, it becomes difficult. So that's enhancing security. The second big challenge we see is protecting sensitive data in the application. So we say there are multiple applications, some of which may or may not store sensitive data. Now the data could be sensitive from a regulatory point of view, say GDPR or HIPAA or, or some other. Uh, data privacy regulation or it may be sensitive from an internal point of view also that you you have some sensitive data you don't want it to be leaked to your competitors or you don't want it to be leaked to the the wider public at large okay so how do you protect data in these applications the data which is deemed sensitive um, there are authorization concepts th there are security mechanisms available in applications the new age applications provide a a much better and and a detailed way of doing it. Whereas if you look at older applications, there may be some ways of doing it, but not that great. So how do you go about protecting this data? You you don't want to protect everything OK in the way that you don't want to hide the whole screen from the user because the screen only has one data field which is sensitive. So you still want to give a all the access to the user, but take away this particular field value from the user. So how do you achieve that across different varied applications across a landscape which is cloud and on prem? And then the third set of challenges protecting documents and data on the move. Now we spoke about security in the applications, then sensitive data in the applications, but there is also a requirement that this data may be downloaded into Excel into Word documents or PDFs or 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 in, in any other way. So with, which is the data is leaving the application. Now, how do you protect that part? Because once the data has left the application, then it can be shared in in whatever way the user can can find out. So we we hear about solutions like endpoint protection and um, all these other information protection solutions, but most of these rely on uh, a human being taking a decision on classifying the data. So if I go to let's say an SAP system and I download a report, uh, I have to then classify this document or this Excel file or the mail that I'm going to send with this attachment. I have to classify it as confidential, internal, public, whatever. So what happens if I miss doing this? So that is a challenge. So this protecting documents on the move automatically based on whether the data in these documents is sensitive or not is something which is still not available. That's a big challenge. OK, so what we are in the end looking at is we we the businesses want to actually get some way to have a balance between giving the access and agility to run the business, which means you don't want to stop the business like the example I, I gave that you don't want to hide the whole screen from the user just because you don't want the user to see one part of the screen. OK, so that's where you want to provide the access and agility, but at the same time keep the data safe and business compliant. So you want intelligent ways or you want advanced ways of of managing access and keeping your organization compliant and safe. So how do we achieve that uh, um, um, in, in today's environment when companies are more and more going into digital transformations? OK, adopting cloud as well as new age technology products. So for for this, um, what we are going to explain now is a new concept of attribute based access control. So this uh, this concept moves away from the historical way of managing access, which is 
role based wherein somebody uh, a user gets access based on the roles that have been defined by an administrator or a security person and assigned to a user's access we move away from this into a more systemic and runtime determination of access based on certain um, uh, attributes which could be user or identity attributes so these are like attributes or values re uniquely related to a user a user's department or the type of user okay or the job level of the user or they can be environmental or context attributes which could be the ip address from where the user is accessing the time at which the user is accessing the data or the network location or type of network connection vpn versus uh, a corporate um, company network or the third set is content or data attribute so this is the part where we say what is the type of data being accessed is it sensitive data is it non sensitive data is the type is the document being accessed uh, by the user containing sensitive data or or it does not contain sensitive data so using a combination of these attributes the system automatically will will um, uh, evaluate policies which are predefined based on the organizational needs and take a decision at run time to whether to show something to the user or or not show that something to the user okay rather than relying on what was granted to the user so for example i join a company as a finance manager i get some access as a finance manager now instead of relying on what is there in this finance manager access the system every time i try to access a sensitive data or or i try to do something which which uh, drives a policy evaluation the system will then calculate or check or evaluate whether i should be allowed to do this at that moment or not so this is dynamic or or systemic determination of access at run time by the system so with this what we achieve is we have simplification okay which means we great to a greater extent simplify how the accesses are managed okay especially in case of wider landscape where you have multiple systems also ensuring consistency that if i if i am not allowed to do something in one system or if i am not allowed to see certain type of data it is not just restricted to one system okay it has to be applied consistently across all the systems because the data flows between systems or the data may be present across multiple systems so instead of doing one by one in different systems this kind of a concept once enforced will ensure consistency okay it becomes more preventive okay you can prevent things from happening rather than putting detection measures later on on who access something and then and then you do some assessments and impact assessment and all um, the security or or compliance is to a greater extent automated okay the system can automatically uh, uh, find out okay if, if the data is sensitive okay based on that it will not allow or allow the user to see in the application and also take it forward when the same data is getting downloaded the system knows that the data being downloaded is sensitive so you don't require somebody to apply a classification manually saying this is confidential the system understands it it automatically applies that and it automatically protects what is going out and and the the monitoring is obviously there because the system is recording and and tracking everything at run time uh, you can um, uh, feed all the logs coming and everything from here into monitoring solutions to detect patterns or or behaviors so this is how um, the concept is now i uh, will uh, pass it on to my colleague krishna uh, who will take uh, you through some of the real life scenarios okay both in terms of security as well as internal audit or internal compliance and and take those scenarios real life scenarios into a, a, a demo mode and show you some of those in in form of a demo over to you krishna thank you nitin for setting up the stage hello everyone uh, my name is krishna i'm a solution architect from next labs so i'll be doing the demo today so we have uh, four scenarios to demo today uh, two scenarios focusing on data protection you know nitin was talking about data privacy and how important it is today uh, so we we'll look at how to protect sensitive data in sap and also we'll see how you protect uh, downloading of data from sap and and also data that is in the form of a file like for example an attachment that you store in sap you know we we'll look at how you can protect such uh, those things and then we have one scenario uh, on fury uh, we'll demonstrate how you can do find drained access control in a fury app 
and then we have one scenario focusing on internal control especially the segregation of duty so we'll look at in how you can use next lab product to implement such uh, sod scenarios let's get into the demo this use case is on data protection especially uh, sap hr data uh, as you know data privacy the need for data privacy is really growing nowadays uh, especially with the regulations such as gdpr in place uh, and also other regulations in different countries uh, it is always a mandate uh, to protect identity of individuals uh, and again you know uh, sap is no exception for that so e e even in even in sap you know we store uh, sensitive information about employee uh, such as pii uh, personally identifiable information in especially in H sap hr module uh, let's take a look at you know how we can protect such sensitive information using next labs product and you know we use a dynamic data masking technique uh, in, in this example um, using one of the next lab product and uh, we will look at uh, in sap hr you know uh, there are different transactions where you display uh, ssn uh, social security number of an employee uh, for example uh, there is a, a t code a pa30 where you display employee record and also a report called par1 where it lists uh, different employee data including ssn uh, well, well in this example we'll see multiple ways to uh, protect such information uh, one in one scenario we'll see how to mask uh, certain characters in the ssn let's say out of 10 10 digits in ssn uh, we would mask the the first eight digits and then we will leave it open the two digits at the end and then the second scenario we look at you know can we mask somewhere in between you know instead of masking in the beginning so we, we, what we do is that we will actually skip uh, two digits in the front and also uh, you know uh, one digit or two digits at the end and then we'll mask everything in between Again, this is just to demonstrate that you know dynamic data masking uh, functionality can be used in different ways based on the need. Uh, and then you know we'll also look at uh, HR admin user uh, where there is no restriction on uh, to see the data. So part of uh, his roles and responsibilities, you know, he's, uh, he's allowed to see the data. And also you know, we'll see you know even though he's allowed to see the data within SAP, uh, but he's not allowed to take the data out of SAP. Uh, so we'll look at uh, what we call a DLP, data loss prevention scenario where when when an admin user try to uh, you know extract the data or download the data from sap to a local file so he'll be denied so let's take a look at this in the system yeah let's start with the uh, the hr uh, the initial SS, ssn masking so this is the policy uh, we can i define this policy only for one user just to demonstrate so demo user 5 uh, this this policy is applicable and let's look at the definition of the masking. So, the SSN field, you know, in SAP gets stored in a table called PA002. Uh, it's actually a info type uh, that that's in the HR module, uh, and it's called personal data info type. And the field name is called PERID. That's the field that is used in SAP. And uh, here, you know, as you can see, we use the partial mask. We can instead of full mask we chose partial mask and then here you can define your your condition for the partial masking uh, the first uh, part you know before the slash that indicates how many positions to skip or how many positions not to mask and then you mention your masking uh, pattern including how many positions so let's say you want to mask three positions you will mention three uh, maybe a star 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 or xxx or maybe hash 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 and then you have a um, slash followed by how many characters you want to leave at the end you don't want to mask it so basically you can define uh, initial how many characters you want to skip you can define how many characters you want to skip at the end and then you can define what is your format for the mask in the middle you can also apply a condition uh, we, I, I didn't write anything here but that's also possible so let's let's like look at this one um, so uh, I already logged into demo user 5. Uh, we can take a quick look at it. So he's logged in demo user 5. Uh, so, in for SSN information for all the employees in SAP, so there is a report called uh, PAR1. Uh, there is a T code actually. And then uh, I'm going to pick uh, a variant uh, that I already created uh, for the, you know, uh, for the list of. Uh, yeah, the, the, the default variant that, that I created. Uh, so basically, this particular variant runs across the board and brings in uh, the SSN information for all the employees. Let me just execute this. Yeah. 
So you can see here the personal ID, as I said, personal ID is the name used in SAP for the session. Uh, you can see that, you know, the personal ID, the initial eight characters are masked and the, uh, the remaining, the two at the end are uh, kept as is. So we define the policy as, you know, zero position to skip. So meaning you mask from the beginning and that there are eight uh, X and then two characters left at the end, right? So that's why you see um, that you have, you know, uh, partial masking applied on the SSM. So there are some users, you know, uh, for example, if you look at this particular user, uh, he he does not, he's not an American. So I mean, he's not, he's not, he's not in USA. So there is no SSN assigned to him. Um, and the, actually the value is completely blank. That's why uh, you don't see anything at the end because there is no uh, true value as well. Okay. So this way, you know, you can see uh, how to apply a partial masking. So let's take a quick look at another scenario where you try to mask somewhere in between. The same same uh, scenario, but for a different user. So let, let me show you the policy real quick. Yeah, HR masking partial two. Uh, the same, we're going to mask the same uh, personal ID, but uh, it is relevant only to demo user six. So this particular uh, policy is applicable only to the user six. And the masking condition, you can look at it, the same table and same field. The partial masking I defined as two position to skip and in the beginning and two position to skip at the end and the remaining everything you need to mask. That's the uh, policy definition. So let's take a look at it uh, from demo user six. Yeah, so this is a demo user six here. So let me go back and run the report again, run the T code again, P A R one. Okay, so let me pick up the variant instead of. Uh, that's it. Let me execute this report. Yeah, as you can see here, uh, in the personal ID, which is SSN field, you can see that two digits are displayed in the beginning, two displayed at the end, the remaining everything is masked uh, in between, right? So in this way, you know, you can apply different types of partial masking using a simple policy. Let's look at the same data, you know, the PA002 table, how it looks for HR admin. As we said, the HR admin is a kind of a super user and so there is no restriction. Um, so unlike the previous scenario where uh, users were seeing some masked value, uh, HR admin should be able to see all the values uh, without any restriction. Let's take a look. So I logged in as HR admin, you can see here. And then I just uh, know the table PA002. And then you can try to uh, look at the content of the table. So I'm going to execute it wide open. So you can see, you know, you can see the data here and also the period, which is the SSN number. Uh, you can see that you can see the actual value instead of uh, the masked value, you know. Um, and then, you know, so this way, you know, you can protect the data uh, for certain users or certain criteria. You can mask the values and some certain users, you can show the actual value. And also, uh, you know, even if H, even the HR admin is able to see the actual value, uh, if he's trying to download this particular data, you know, we can have a control so that you know he cannot he can he should not be allowed to download so let's take a quick, quick look at it that's what we call a dlp data loss prevention scenario uh, let's try to download this do, uh, data into a file and see what happens so i'll select all the data here and then let's try to download i'm going to load the local file uh, let's select uh, the type of file that you want to create and then i'm gonna you know save it into my desktop here so let's call let's say pa Then you know, let's click on generate. Let's see, let's see what happens. So, as you can see here in the message, you see that user is not authorized to download the document. So, basically, the downloading of since two data is prevented uh, again here. So, even though HR admin is able to see the data, so he is allowed to use the data uh, within SAP, but he is not authorized to take the data outside of SAP. That's why you know, when he's trying to download the document, he's got he's got denied. And again, this is controlled with a policy. So this concludes the uh, data production scenario uh, on H SAP HR data. Scenario uh, we're going to demonstrate is uh, at the time of downloading a document, uh, basically an attachment from SAP, uh, the document will be protected based on the policy. And based on the policy, uh, there will be different permissions or rights that will be assigned to different users. 
uh, to demonstrate this you know we will be downloading a document uh, attachment from sap and then we will we will check that the document is protected with uh, different rights for different people so we we're going to use three different users uh, engineer 1 bomb engineer 1 bomb engineer 4 and bomb project 1 bomb engineer 1 uh, will be uh, downloading the document uh, with protection so we can, he can see that we can check that you know he will have uh, all permissions on the document whereas engineer 4 do not have any permissions on the document whereas project 1 user he can view the document he can print the document but he is not allowed to edit the document so let, let's uh, check these things in the system so uh, this is bomb engineer 1 uh, in sap system uh, we're going to run a transaction cs03 uh, which is a display of a bomb uh, this is a, a material bomb uh, that uh, that we have created and on the material bomb on the header data we have different dir document info records that are in, that are connected to it uh, we have is uh, we're going to pick a specific we can, we can have multiple dirs so we're going to pick a specific dir here and then D, this particular dir has the attachments connected to it as part of linked objects uh, as you can see there are two attachments connected here one is a cylinder uh, vds file it's a 3d uh, visual drawing file and then we have we also have a sap pocket knife it's a, as a as a vds file so engineer one uh, will, will uh, let's try to uh, let's try to view the file and also to download the file so when, when you try to view the file let's say when you try to double click uh, to view the file um, so what happens is that the, the file uh, temporarily gets downloaded to a system and then it, it opens up in the enterprise visual viewer as you can see now th this is how uh, he can view the uh, he can view the file uh, now let's let's try to download this document and then see whether the file uh, gets protected or not so to download the file use the option of copy to uh, I'm going to download this to a folder called uh, demo on the desktop on my system. So as you can see the file has been downloaded. You can go and check the file. I'm going to check the file here. So it's in the desktop demo folder. You can see the file got created now. Uh, you can also see that there is an extension NXL uh, which means that this particular product, uh, this particular attachment is, is protected and NXL is the extension. Uh, that next labs assigned to it when, when it protects the document so on this protected document uh, you can also see uh, currently uh, you know uh, we have different users so let me so we have a uh, sky drm component which is uh, which is part of the uh, part of the product so that particular component you know, manages the uh, different users authorization so i'm going to log in uh, with the bomb engineer one into the sky drm client So I logged into Bomb Engineer 1. So if I try to um, open this particular protected document, um, as you can see, uh, the document, uh, you know, it, it's uh, open in um, in the 3D Visual Enterprise uh, Viewer. So you can, you know, it's a visual diagram. You can rotate it, and you can also play. Uh, you can also try to edit it. It has an option to edit as well. And you can also see that uh, there is a watermark that gets generated on the document with uh, user id and also date and timestamp so basically with the watermark you know you could also uh, you even if some fraudulent user trying to take a picture of it uh, you would still be able to trace it back uh, you know uh, who has uh, who took the picture and also who tried to leak particular data so in that way the watermarks will be useful um, so we can also see uh, what are the permissions uh, for this particular user on the file so uh, to check that we can go back to the file and check the file uh, info so when you see the file info it would list different permissions uh, engineer one has on this particular document yeah you can see here so he has uh, right uh, he has permission to view edit print save as and also watermark right, that, those are the permissions for engineer one on that particular document 
So for the same document, let's try to uh, check with uh, different user, let's say engineer four. He does not have any permissions as per the policy. Um, so let's, let me log in as engineer four and try to open the same document. I logged in as bomb engineer 4 uh, let's try to see the same um, same document let's try to view the same document yeah as you can see it, it says access denied so he does, since he does not have access to the file he does not have permission to the file to open it and that's that's coming based on the policy uh, at the time of the document being protected uh, when you when you're trying uh, when you are downloading the document from SAP the time uh, the policy uh, the DRM policy that we have written is applied on the document that's why bomb engineer 4 is not able to see, view this particular document because he does not have access to it uh, you, you can also uh, let's try to check with a different user uh, which is bomb project 1 uh, he should be able to view the document but he, sh he should not be able to edit the document so let me log in as a uh, bomb engineer bomb project uh, one. I logged in as bomb project one user so let's again, let's look at the same document again uh, before i open it i just want to uh, let's see the permissions of the file for this particular user as you can see he has permission to view print save as so he does not have permission to edit and he does not have a watermark so those are the permission uh, so uh, whereas engineer one uh, who is the kind of the owner of the particular document he has every right he has a, a view edit print save as and also watermark on the particular document let's try to open the document uh, with the project one as you can see here uh, you can you, know, you can see he is able to see the document and he, he, as you can see you know there is no watermark so it's again just to demonstrate that uh, you know these uh, these functionalities are controlled with the policy you know for this user we did not include a watermark uh, to demonstrate that so similarly let's try to edit this document and see what happens um, so Let's, let's, uh, I, I tried to change the color and see let me try to save as so as you can see there's a pop-up down below you do not have permission to perform this particular action so I can check that message again uh, you do not have permission to pro perform the save or save as operation so um, you know all the changes he's doing he, he will not be able to save uh, he is not able to save as uh, even in fact he should also be not able to save them as well let's try to save it cannot save model to the file So, in this way, you know, we demonstrated that, you know, at the time of downloading a document from SAP, uh, the document uh, will be protected uh, based on the policies and also the protected document will have different, uh, different users will have different permissions on the document. Uh, even if you send this particular protected document via email to a different user, uh, you know, since uh, outside of your, your organization, for example, um, since that particular user um, will not have any permissions for the policy, so he will not be able to see those particular document. Uh, this use case is on Fury. Uh, let's take a look at how we can use attributes to uh, control data visibility in a Fury app. And the, uh, the app we're going to consider in this demo will be maintain bill of material. Uh, it's one of the key app 
uh, in the SAP PLM and also ECC MM MM area. Uh, basically, the uh, the business process is that you know uh, typically in the NPI the new product introduction, uh, you would like to keep uh, the new product data uh, very confidential until it gets published or until until it gets released. Uh, the way we set up the scenario, uh, there are different users, uh, Bomb Engineer One and Engineer Two, and they are assigned to different projects. So, for example, Bomb Engineer One assigned to Project A, and Bomb Engineer Two is assigned to Project B. And then we have a bomb uh, that has multiple components, uh, basically sub-assemblies uh, in the same bomb, and those sub-assemblies are also assigned to different projects. For example, uh, in the bomb C underscore one two four zero, it has total three components in it, and uh, two components. Assigned to project A and one of the component it assigned to project B. Uh, so let's take a look at you know how we can use uh, you know attributes to uh, control uh, data visibility uh, in this particular scenario. Uh, before I uh, demonstrate user one, user two, I want to quickly show the complete structure of the uh, bomb. So the bomb is C underscore one two four zero. So we have three uh, sub assemblies within the bomb: uh, FG lens, FG uh, thermal image, and spectral band. Uh, FG lens and spectral band both are assigned to project B, whereas thermal image is part of project A. So now let's uh, log in as engineer one. So this is engineer one. Uh, let's go into maintain bomb application. Try to display uh, the bomb C underscore one two four zero. So before we display it, uh, let's look into the search functionality here. Uh, as you type, stop typing the uh, characters. It will show up the possible values from the search. Uh, here you can see that there are some materials with the complete, the full description of the material, but there are few materials where the material description is uh, with star, star, star. So basically, these are all masked because uh, this particular user do not have permission to these uh, materials. Uh, that's why uh, they are shown in mask. Uh, let's pick a material uh, that he has access to. Yeah, it's infrared camera and go into the explosion of the bomb. Yeah, as you can see, uh, even though there are three total components in the bomb, uh, he is only seeing one of them, which is thermal image. Uh, that is because thermal image is only uh, sub assembly that is assigned to project A. The other two sub assemblies are actually part of project B. Uh, that's why, you know, he's not able to see it here. Uh, let's quickly check from engineer 2. This is engineer 2. Uh, try to open the same bomb. As you can see, you know, we have field level control as well. Even though user B, uh, engineer 2, can see the material and the corresponding other attributes, uh, but this specific description he is not authorized to see. That's why you see it is in, in the mass data. Yeah, when he looks at the bomb explosion, uh, you could see that uh, he is seeing two different sub assemblies uh, when compared to engineer one who was only seeing one of them. Uh, for example, he was seeing thermal image, uh, whereas user two, he could see uh, lens and spectral band. So, be, both of these uh, sub, uh, sub assemblies are assigned to project B, and uh, engineer two has membership into project B. Uh, this use case is on internal control. Uh, in the controls, you know, especially you're gonna look at segregation of duties, and then let's 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 take a look at how we can use Next Labs products to implement uh, such SOD controls in SAP. And the business process we're gonna look at is around purchasing. Uh, typically, in the purchasing business process, you have a you create a PO and then you send the PO to the vendor, and then when the vendor sends the goods, you know, you do a GR the goods receipt, and then later on you send an invoice to the vendor uh, for the payment. Uh, in this particular business process, there are multiple uh, subtasks or sub sub functions within it, and the uh, the SOD uh, states that you know you can the same person cannot do multiple key functions in the same business process. Uh, so in this example, we'll look at uh, you know uh, a scenario where uh, when 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 a user is creating a GR, so system would evaluate whether the person who is creating the GR uh, is there any SOD risk with it. Like for example, if he is trying to do the GR. For the same for the PO that he himself created, then there is a risk in the SOD. So the system should identify the risk and inform the user about the SOD risk. Otherwise, you know, meaning you know, if you are doing a GR for a PO which is not created by you, then system should be able to let you do the GR and then you know let you oppose the GR. 
Uh, let's take a look at this one uh, in the demo. So I already logged into demo user one. Uh, let's try to uh, create a GR for uh, one of the PIVO. Um, I've taken PIVO 369. So this particular PIVO is created by uh, demo user one. So we can quickly, let me quickly show you that. Uh, so this is a uh, purchase order report. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna display a list of purchasing documents created by demo user one for this particular uh, vendor. As you can see, 369 uh, is created by uh, demo user one, right? So now, let's say when he tries to post the GR for this, so let's take the posting date here, and then I'm gonna confirm this particular line. Saying that this particular line is being the goods has been received. So as you can see here, uh, so there is a pop-up uh, with SOD compliance. So this particular pop-up is actually coming from policy. Uh, so the next lab policy uh, that is evaluating the SOD risk in this particular business process. Um, you know, uh, he is actually uh, showing this particular pop-up, and it says that access is subject to SOD risk. Do you acknowledge the risk and wish to continue? So it actually warns the user about the risk, uh, and then the user can decide whether he wants to continue or not. If he chooses to continue, yes, he will be allowed to go ahead and post GR. But if he chooses to not to continue, then he will be completely stopped. So let's take a scenario. Let's try to say no here. Then action is cancelled, and then user is completely taken out of the Migo transaction. So the, basically the particular transaction that he's trying to post is not committed. So he's the, the transaction is completely cancelled and it, it goes out of the, uh, the particular document as well. Let's try to, uh, maybe let's also uh, look at uh, what happens if we try to click S in this particular scenario. Let's try to do the same thing again. I'm, I'm going to create a Migo. Uh, for the same document, uh, I'm just um, giving a posting date where my period is open. And then I'm going to confirm my line item with the goods. Let's try to post. So again, you have this SOD risk pop up uh, from the policy. So now I'm I'm saying S to this. So I know the risk. I want to go ahead. So you can see that the uh, the GR has been posted with uh, uh, document 585. So in this way, you know, if a user understands the risk, he's allowed to post the GR. So now let's take an example where the uh, demo user one is trying to post a GR uh, for a PO that is created by somebody else. So let's pick a PO. Uh, let me run that report again i just want to look at the pos that are created by um, demo user 2 and uh, for the same vendor yeah so we have uh, uh, purchase order 370 that's created by demo user 2 so let's try to uh, do a uh, migo again so i'm gonna do it from the beginning again here so i went into me go i choose purchase order i'm gonna key in my purchase order here so this purchase order is, is not created by me so i should be allowed to create uh, this particular uh, gr so i'll complete my item and then let's post okay so there is a posting period uh, issue that uh, we can quickly correct so uh, let me change the posting date Okay, and then let me post it again. Okay, so as you can see, document is successfully posted. So, in this particular scenario, there is no SOD risk associated with the process because uh, the person who is doing GR is different from the person who created or changed the PO. Uh, that's why you didn't see any SOD pop up here. But whereas in the previous scenario, uh, where the same person is doing both the both the key functions. Uh, then SOD uh, risk has been shown. So uh, just to look at how this is done in the system. So I'll, I'll let me quickly show you the the corresponding policy for this. So we have uh, SOD check for PO and GR. So we can have similar SOD checks for multiple different scenarios in different uh, um, you know functions like you know finance, you know, um, uh, manufacturing, purchasing, sales. You know different functions we could have uh, different SOD checks. Uh, and you know you can you can define you know uh, which are the tra transactions that you want to evaluate the SOD check. So here you mentioned Migo, and then you know you saying the SOD check uh, if it is enabled, um, then and the pop up you know the GRC mitigation pop up it's actually defined. So you can you can so we have we have control and configuration to define 
what should be the mechanism to inform the user whether it is a simple SAP message like like you display at the bottom of the bar or it could be a pop-up that shows up in a separate window so here we have chosen GRC mitigation pop-up and that's why uh, it shows that particular uh, uh, pop-up in the scenario so in this way uh, you know next lab uh, next lab product can be used to implement a lot of internal controls or GRC compliance related information very easily and the policies as I said it's very uh, generic in the sense you know you can apply the same policy for multiple different use cases um, you don't have to create uh, one by uh, multi, uh, each policy for each scenario you can you can generalize them and put into a single policy and also it's very easy to manage the policies uh, you know with uh, audit log uh, with the policy definitions itself who if anybody change the policies you can see the log and also all the transaction log you know whether the SOD check uh, whether it is whether it is uh, uh, true or false whether it is SOD related or not all those audit is also stored in here um, you know and there are a lot of reports which could help uh, the internal audit team to uh, to uh, demonstrate or prove that there was no uh, SOD violations in, in, a, in a given particular business process or in a given uh, time period so all those functionalities are readily available out of the box uh, and then they are they are well 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 received by many customers um, especially the auditing part awesome thank you krishna thank you nitin uh if so we we did get a couple of messages that some people uh had a couple uh either lag or issues with the screen being frozen don't worry we are recording this entire webinar so we can send you we'll be sending everyone a copy of the recording that they can view uh in the meantime we were sent some questions and i know that nitin has been hard at work answering a lot of those in chat but we also have some that were messaged to us directly so krishna and nitin uh, in the case of an internal control scenario, uh, is there any sort of mechanism for a compliance officer to be informed of any sort of compliance risks, such as via email? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so yeah, so we do have an option where you can notify the compliance officer via email. So uh, in the Next Labs Control Center, uh, we have a mechanism called alerting. So if you define an alert, and in, in that alert definition, you can mention that whenever there is a SOD risk identified, uh, you can mention uh, which email address you want to notify. Uh, it could be a one person email or it could be a you know, group email. Uh, and then, you know, whenever such scenario is identified, you know, system will send an email notification to the corresponding email address. That's possible. Yeah. Awesome. And I'd love to ask some of the questions that uh, were already answered in chat, but just for recording's sake. So, uh, a couple minutes ago, we were asked, uh, can you add digital rights management controls to a downloaded report ver instead of having a downloaded document, just like you demonstrated? Yeah, I think it's already answered. Yes, it's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can also define, you know, what type of control you want when you, when you download a report. Let's say, for example, you're downloading a HR report or when you're downloading a finance report. So you can, um, you, you can, you can have a policy to auto classify the data based on the type of data in the report. So it could it could assign some sensitivity whether it is uh, you know is it okay to be accessible by everybody or it is to be accessible by only few people so those things are possible with a policy. Awesome. We just got a question now. Uh, what's the difference between this solution that you've demonstrated and the next lab solution for export controls? Um, next lab solution for export control and uh, what's the uh, comparison between? Uh, export control and what's the question again Charles? can you clarify uh, what is the difference between this solution and the next lab solution for export controls so in fact you know uh, these are all part of next lab platform you know i mean so export control you know usually uh, uh, we have a product called dynamic authorization management uh, which is called dam so dam is typically used in export control scenarios where you can define which materials are export control and then you can control who can see uh, specific uh, materials uh, and uh, in this particular demo, we use multiple products from Next Lab. So, uh, for, for example, on the data masking part, uh, it's a separate product called DAE, uh, Data Access Enforcer. And then for the SOD, you know, we use DAM, which is a dynamic authorization management. So, 
I would say you know all all these part of Nextlab product platform, uh, but you know we have a specific uh, you know use cases for specific product, and export control is primarily done with DAM, which is called dynamic authorization management. Awesome. Uh, another question: Does masking work in the case of HANA DB? Uh, yes. So the masking, you know, it doesn't, uh, you know, there is no dependency on what type of database you're using. So the masking is done at the time of extracting the data. So whether it is Oracle, DB2, or HANA, so it, it, work, it works across the board. And then it, it is shown in the UI. So again, it is UI independent. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're using GUI or Fury or even some custom front end. So it doesn't differentiate between UI. It also doesn't differentiate between uh, database. So it works for HANA too. Awesome. Is it possible to block the GR processes if the PO is created by the same person instead of just a pop-up showing? There is an SOD conflict in NextLab solution. Yeah. So it is. It is. Uh, it is possible to stop the user completely. Uh, but in the way we demonstrated, we we gave that flexibility to the user uh, whether to decide uh, whether you want to go ahead. But if if a, if a, if if a customer, if the client really requires that to stop. Meaning, you know, you don't want to give an option to the user. You want to completely stop that transaction. So that's possible. We can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that just came in. Do we have to install any package in the SAP system to enable NextLab policies? Yes, that's a good question. So NextLab, uh, NextLab product has, I would classify two different categories. There is There are add-ons that you install in SAP. So there is a NextLab add-on and there is an Excel ECC and an Excel S4H. There are at least two, three different add-ons that you install an SAP server. And also uh, for the policy uh, management, you know, uh, to write the policies, uh, to manage the policies. So there is a separate system. It's an external to SAP. It's a Java-based application. Uh, so to when you when you implement NextLab, you have to do both the things. You have to install add-on to SAP and also set up your uh, uh, policy system and then build the integration between. So again, the integration is very standard. So that comes out of, I mean, at least part of the product. Uh, but yeah, so add-on installation is required in SAP and uh, policy system installation is required external to SAP. Awesome. Uh, I don't think there are any more questions that were sent to us. So I think it might be a good time to wrap up or wait, we just got one more. To apply restrictions, sure. do we need to make any program level changes? Um, so uh, so what, no, out of the uh, part of the product, uh, out of the box, we have around 500, uh, more than 500 T codes where the integration is already built. So you don't have to do any code change. Uh, but if you're if you are trying to implement this for a custom program or a custom T code, uh, then there's an API that we provide you part of the NextLab product. So, and the developer has to call the API and then that would, that, would, that API would, would actually call the policy and get the result back. So the answer is yes and no. Uh, in case of a custom program, you have to do some coding. And in case of a standard SAP, you know, product has uh, out of the box enablement for more than 500 P codes and also 100 plus Fury apps. Uh, and then it's also easy to add more apps. You know, it's a simple configuration. Uh, so most of the time, you know, uh, we could uh, get away from code change. We can just manage with the configuration. Uh, but uh, in case of custom transactions, definitely it is a code change. Uh, do you have a predefined list of controls slash policies for ITGC slash finance business processes? That's a very good question. Uh, so currently, you know, we don't have, uh, but we are working on it. Uh, we wanted to deliver out of the box uh, content for, for example, finance processes or maybe GDPR. Um, so that's in the plan, uh, but currently it's not available, uh, but it's going to come very soon. Awesome. Okay. In that case, uh, if anyone has any more questions, we'll be sending a follow-up email. Feel free to reply to that, and I will make sure to get you in contact with someone who can answer them. Uh, a big thank you again to Nitin and Krishna for speaking today. Uh, do any of you two have any final parting words? No, it's a it's a good it's a good session overall. So uh, feel free to send email to Charles. You know, if, if you have any questions, and then we will be happy to. I provide you more details. Again, this is a high level overview. You know, there's a lot of features uh, Next Labs can do, and you can get uh, uh, get a good idea about it uh, with more uh, documentation, other details that we can share. So uh, feel free to contact us if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Anything from you, Nin? 
Yeah, so uh, I mean, there are tremendous possibilities of using this product. We only were able to show four use cases. So if you have anything specific in mind where you see uh, maybe the product can be used or if at all it can be used, uh, we will be more than happy to maybe arrange another follow-up demo for a specific use case. Mm -hmm. Once again, thank you all and have a nice day. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. All right, thank you.